Hey, it's Matt Pinfield here for KLOS New and Approved, and I'm here with the incredible Jeff Skunk Baxter. And I'm <laughs> really excited to have Skunk here on the show, man. You know, I approached him recently at a live show. It was a party for uh, his dear friend and mine, a Slim Jim Phantom. It was like a wedding party because he never really got to have that wedding reception during the That's pandemic. Right. That's right. And uh, it was great to see you play up there with him and... Uh, my girlfriend was really excited to see you there because she's a huge fan as well. So, welcome to the show, Scott. Well, thanks for your hospitality. Yeah, it's great to have you. You have a new album out called Speed of Heat, and we'll be talking about that as well. But I want to go back and, and go through your incredible history. Now, you were born in D.C., but you eventually ended up like, you know, having a, your parents had a big record collection at the age of five. You know, you were checking out and become very interested in music. But I, I love, and you know, starting bands when you were younger, but I want to talk about how you ended up working at Manny's Music Shop in New well, York actually, City. Well, actually, I keep having to correct that. Yeah. I worked at Jimmy's. Oh, you worked at across Jimmy's? Across the street. So, right, Frank and Jimmy's Squalachi, right? Yeah. But Henry Goldrick, who was really the sort of guru at Manny's, because I was living in Mexico City and going to school in Connecticut and commuting back and forth, a lot of times I wouldn't go back during vacations. I would stay work on 48th Street, work at Jimmy's and Dan Armstrong's place, and then play shows at night in, in clubs. And Henry was kind of, just kept an eye on me. Because, you know, I'm you know 4,000 miles away from home. And you were a teenager, too. I was just a kid. I was yeah. just, you know, I, was, I started boarding school when I was 13. Yeah. So he kept an eye on me, and this really special guy. And, and I'll tell you, Quick story, if you if you want. Oh yeah, I want to hear it. I mean, everybody knows Henry because Henry would you know every guitar player, every musician. You go into Henry, you go into any of the shops. You got fifteen seconds to get out of my store. You want to buy something, but he was gruff, but he was also had a huge heart. And when I started working for the Department of Defense, or had the offer, I went to Henry, and I said, Henry, I got something I want to talk to you about store was absolutely packed he said let's go upstairs go upstairs to the third floor to the you know storeroom sit on what you got on your mind i said i really want to do this i'm taking a little bit of heat from my friends but this is something that's really important to me he said tell me why you want to do this so i told him and he said you got to go do that yeah. go do it and here's a guy who people only think of as a guy that sells musical instruments it, it just goes to show you that there are people in your life and there are a lot of people who you just, a lot of people don't know the depth and presence that they really have. And he was a guy that was really looking out for me, you know, when I was just a kid. So I think back to 48th Street, and many of us worked on Steve Pisani, who was over at, um, at Kelly Guitars. Um, Elliot Randall, he worked on 48th Street. We all, we all grew up on 48th Street. You know, we were 48th Street kids. And so there's a bond, there's a family there. Uh, of that. And then I just think back that, you know, there was people that were, the people that were there for you when you really weren't sure what was going on. I don't know. And Henry, I know that you're up there somewhere selling instruments up in heaven yeah. at 40 off. Good for you. Uh, just, yeah. I want to give him a little credit for being quite the human being. That is so great. I mean, and think about that period. I had no idea Elliot Randall also, uh, you know, was in, became your friend back then, you know, early on before the yeah. Steely Dan stuff. But talk to me also about, there was a, you met Hendrix back in that time too. Yeah, uh, he had a band called Jimmy James and the Blue Flames and came under the store and uh, had a guitar, kind of beat up old Fender Duasonic and he wanted to get something nicer. And I was repairing guitars and built, you know, doing a bunch of guitar work. And then I had just set up a uh, um, a, 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 a right-handed guitar for left-handed players. And the guy never came in and bought it. So I traded it even. Seemed like a nice guy. Traded it even. Frank Squalacci got real mad at me. He said, I'm docking you three weeks' pay for that because it's not a great deal. So, oh, all right, whatever. And then that scene invited me to come down to the club and hang out. And then the bass player didn't show up for one gig, so I was there, and, you know. You said it was Jimmy James and the guys, right? That's cool. And with Hendrix. Randy and... California was there in the band, and Randy and I became very close friends. Yeah, and then years later, of course, you recorded with Spirit. You yeah. Know, Spirit well, Randy was you know, another special guy. Yeah. You know? What a great what a great player, man. I love those And a great too. human being. Yeah. I mean, he passed away saving his son. 
I did not know that story. Will you tell me that? I mean, it was up on the North Shore of Hawaii. Big waves, huge yeah. waves. His son was out in the ocean. Wave took him under. Randy went out, got him, brought him back. And and just when he had put him on the beach, Wave came and took him. Wow, that's an unbelievable story. So again, special people. Yeah, you, know, you got to remember, you got to keep them in your heart. Yeah, absolutely, 100%. Randy California, great songs, great guitar player. Oh, like yourself. Yeah, great human being. Yeah, and I love that. I mean, that's amazing because I, somebody I never got to meet who I admired in a big way as well and thought was was great. I, lo- I love hearing that he was he was a good man as well. Huge. You know, which is incredible. So then you ended up, you were going to school in Boston, right? So, so you eventually you were, you Went were in to, Boston. I did a year of college in Boston. Yeah. And tell me about, you ended up being an ultimate spinach for like the last... <laughs> yes. uh, yeah. yeah, that was fun. I was working at Jack's Drum Shop. Yeah. Because um, you always work in music stores. So that's the way you meet musicians. And um guy came in and said I was, they were looking for a guitar player. So I jumped over the counter and said, sure. Yeah. I told Jack I'd come back later. He always said I was fine. You know, he didn't care. Yeah. And uh, yeah, joined the Ultimate Spinach, and the uh, leader of the organization, uh, Ian Bruce Douglas, had just left, and so it kind of here I am with a band, and looking for stuff to do. So uh, um, I remember we had a kind of a minor hit. We re- we covered uh, Romeo and Juliet, which yeah. is one of my favorite tunes anyway. The reflections. And we had a lot of fun. We toured with. Yeah. Uh, that's when I Mark and Howard. Uh, from the, the turtles. turtles, we got to be really close because the turtles and ultimate spinach toured, vanilla fudge, Vinny and Carmine. And it was like this, this yeah, you know, and Tim was, and all those guys, yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. another another great guys, absolutely, and love. Oh that. yeah, and I always say to people, I go, you know, you, you can you can't beat that cover if you keep me hanging on. I mean, it was just so well reconstructed to come out brilliant. six months after the original. It was slow incredible. it down, yeah, make it rock. Yeah, and Mark Stein's voice was incredible on it. Everything oh, about yeah. it. yeah. Vinny played great guitar. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Those guys were unbelievable. I, I absolutely love that. that as and well. Tim, what a wonderful bass player. I mean, just, again, like it was a very talented band. That whole Long Island scene, the Rascals, the Vagrants, Vanilla Fudge, the Hassles, all bands that were out there, they were extremely talented. And it was something, I'm, I'm not sure how this worked out, but it seemed like the bands that didn't play at Woodstock kind of faded away. The bands that did play at Woodstock went on to have very successful careers. And the Young Rascals were asked to play at Woodstock, and their manager said no. And, yeah. you know, and But I still keep in touch with Gene Cornish. Yeah. Uh, he's a, well, Again, we were friends when we were kids. Yeah. And Felix. I do shows yeah. with him, when, especially we do a lot of charity work for uh, St. Jude Hospital. Yeah. And um, we have a great band called Six Wire that comes in from Nashville. And myself and and Felix and Alice Cooper and we all come in and do two or three songs and of course we end up playing together and everybody else's stuff. That's so great because but it's again it's yeah. it, that that those childhood I call them childhood I'm almost seventy five, yeah. but I call them child you know childhood uh, relationships that still still continue and when you lose one I mean we lost Robbie yeah uh, Robertson uh, just a little while ago and we're starting to lose. The, the good ones. Some incredible guys, you know what I mean? We, I absolutely. trade them for the bad guys in a heartbeat, but I can't do that. Yeah, abs- that's for sure. Not yet. You know? Yeah. Working on <laughs> yeah working, which is great. Yeah, I love the Rascals, too. All the bands you mentioned. I'm what just... a great band. Yeah. My, our drummer in, 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 in my band, Mark Damien, I saved a bunch of uh, clips from the Ed Sullivan show of the Rascals because I wanted the him to see Dino Donnelly. Yeah, who we just lost, right? Yeah. Who we, again, we just lost him. And yeah. what what a powerhouse drummer he was. Yeah. And I showed this stuff to Mark and he's going, my God, this guy's like thermonuclear. I said, yeah, he was very, this guy was a powerhouse drummer. Yeah. He was a drummer and a half. Yeah, I guess they they released so many great songs, and I, I love those tracks from oh from yeah. my childhood. I mean, I still and they rocked. They absolutely rocked. Those guys were also the backing band, I think, for Joey Dean and Starlighters for a while at the Pepper and Laughs, um, right? Eddie Rigotti, yeah, and uh, Gene Cornish, yeah. Uh, we're, yeah, we're background singers, and and they you can I can hear I can hear um, um, uh, uh, the, their vocals on... Peppermint uh, Twist or any of those songs? Um, or some of the other ones. 
I'm trying to remember the name of the town. Meet me, baby, down on 45th Street. Yeah. Bo -bo -bo -bo. Yeah. A peppermint twist. Peppermint twist, yeah. There they are. There they are. You, you can hear them. You, it's it's unmistakable. Eddie Rigotti yeah. singing the high part. You know, it's funny. It's funny you saying that now because now when I go back and listen to that song again, I, yeah. I'm going to hear that. And it's going to sound like the backing vocals you'll hear on Good Loving or something like that. Absolutely. Eddie, you know? he's got this unmistakable voice. Yeah. I, I love that stuff. Talk to me. Skunk, about when you made the decision where you went west and uh, you decided you were going to move to Los Angeles to become a session player because eventually that brought you uh, into working with Steely Dan and being a part of a founding member. Did you know Donald Fagan and Walter Becker in their period when they were like backing up Jane the Americans and were did you know them from around New York? Because I know they were in Brooklyn. I met kind of the way this all worked out. I was living in Boston yeah, and I was doing a lot of work at a studio called Intermedia Sound. Yeah. And I'm not wasn't there was no house guitar player, but I kept ending up doing sessions and I was commuting back and forth from Boston to New York to do sessions in New York as well. And this was well, it was back in the you know, late sixties. And um and then the, like nineteen seventy and there was a band recording at the intermediate sound called the Bead Game. A killer band. Uh, as a matter of fact, Jimmy Hotter, the drummer in the band, ended up I brought him into Steely Dan as the drummer. Um, and uh, John Sheldon, who was the guitar player, again, a killer, killer player. Yeah. And so they were recording, and their producer was a gentleman named Gary Katz. And Gary eventually became the producer for Steely Dan. So uh, I was doing a session, and I'm trying to remember who it was with, uh, Jonathan Edwards or something, I don't remember. Yeah. And Gary stuck his head in, and he said, hey, uh, you know, wow, I'd like to talk to you. Uh, I like the way you play. I'm doing this project with a lady named Linda Hoover in New York, uh, and there's these two songwriters, then Walter Becker and Donald Fagan, who were writing a, a lot of the material for it. Would you come down and work on the on the record? And I said, sure, you know, it's what I do. So I got on a train, went down there, and um, walked into the studio, and there was Walter and Donald, and they were had written the, a bunch of the tunes that we had done for Linda. And after we finished... Uh, they said, well, we've never really heard anybody like play guitar <laughs> like that. And I said, well, I've never really heard material like this. This is really cool stuff. So we made a sort of a, a pack that whoever gets their nose under the tent first calls everybody else and we'll form a band. So Walter and Donald moved out to Los Angeles to uh, take advantage of a publishing deal that, that uh, Gary Katz had negotiated with uh, ABC Dunhill Records. And so, bingo, that was it. Okay, that's the nose under the tent. Get on the phone. They called Denny Diaz to come and play guitar. I called Dave Palmer. The yeah, singer who sang. And Richie you know. and, and um, Dave, um, Jimmy Hodder, and that was the band. Yeah. Unbelievable. Those for, you know, Can't Buy a Thrill, what a great album. And, you know, with three different singers. on Jimmy, of course, sang Midnight Cruiser. What and a you great have, voice like, that guy. Yeah, he had a great and voice. And the original single. Yeah. Dallas. Yeah, Dallas was the one that came out with, uh, I think, some Stuff the Waterway or something. It was whatever the B-side was. But yeah. I remember, it's yeah. very rare today. It's and hard to get. And they pulled it because they thought they were afraid that people would think with the name Steely Dan and uh, the, the, the song was too country. Yeah. Meanwhile, Poco covered it and a whole bunch of other. It was a really cool song. Yeah, it was. Yeah. And then, but, uh, you know, and the story's so crazy looking back about how Do It Again was actually played uh, in a radio station, and Jay Lasker, or, or Lasker from the, re the record label was like, tell them to stop playing it. And the, and the guy who was doing promo goes, I can't. They're playing it on the air every minute. It was a station in the Midwest. Right. Played Do It Again first. And he, right. he at that point, he wanted only a fool would, would say that to be the single, which you do the Mexican voice on the end of it. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> like up in Mexico, right? Yeah. And again, <laughs> um, not to you know take away, but when you mention a guy like Jay Lasker. Yeah. Jay Lasker and Howard Stark were the president and vice president of ABC Records. Yeah. Classic record guys. Oh, yeah. Big chair, big cigar, the whole deal. Very, as a matter of fact, that's we used to rehearse in Jay's office, and we broke our gear down in time so that when Jay showed up and cleaned up the office and he never knew that we were there until <laughs> one day, I guess we got a little extra buzzed, and we forgot to break down. He comes and says, what the hell is this crap? And so and Gary said, well, it's this band, you know, and uh, all right, let me listen to him. And, uh, you know, sits back and says, okay, I'll sign yeah. you guys. And um, 
When I got the uh, opportunity to play with the Doobie Brothers, when Steely Dan decided to stop, when Walter and Donald decided to stop touring, I walked into Jay and I said, Jay, I have this incredible opportunity to, to join the Doobies, but I know I'm under contract. I mean, they're, on, they're signed to Warner Brothers and I know I'm under contract to you, so just tell me what I need to do. So again, Jay leans back in his chair, lights a big cigar and says, Skunk, you never lied to me. You always told me the truth. You were always straight for me. He reached into the drawer, pulled a contract, tear it in half, and said, here you go, buddy. And let you go. Good That's luck. amazing. You know? That, again, those people in your life, yeah, those kind of people, just, I mean, I don't, I don't know what to say. If there was a, a sacrifice or something I had to make or whatever it is, say, well, I always say a prayer for those guys because they changed my life. But, it, you know, people look at guys like that, oh, you know, Jay, you know, Jay Lasker and Howard saw hardcore. Yeah, well, they may be in hardcore record guys, but they were superhuman beings for Christ's yeah, sake. Yeah, exactly. And, and it was really, it was helpful, of course. And, you know, it's great. I I remember I when I was work doing A&R Columbia Records, right, I was there. One of the things I loved to do was take out producers that I, you know, that I really admired the work that they did, besides musicians, and Gary Katz was one of the first. And I talked to him about making, working on the Steely Dan records, and, you know, he shared with me that early on that Donald Fagan didn't have a lot of confidence in his voice as much. That's why David Palmer and Jimmy Hodder ended up right. singing songs on the record, like Dirty Work and Brooklyn and everything, and, you know... Uh, and he said, by the second album, he said to Donald, no, look, you can sing. These are great. Look look what's going on here. And, of course, the rest is history. But what incredible, I mean, Can't Buy the Thrills, just one of the greatest debut well, albums ever. We're just ever. kids. What do we know? I mean, we're just making this record, having <laughs> yeah. a good time, trying to figure out exactly what life is all about. And, uh, and yeah, Jimmy, God bless his soul, incredible voice. Yeah. Something about the tone. Yeah, it was very voice. emotive. Like when he sings "Midnight Cruiser," you feel oh, that yeah. you're riding down. A, you're riding down like Seventh Avenue with you him, bet. and you're feeling you it. And that's the thing that I love so much about it. You I love bet. that record, start to finish. And a killer drummer. Yeah, I mean, again, there's guys that are very famous for their drumming, and there are guys that aren't. Yeah, he's one guy that should be in the drummer. Where if there is a drummer Hall of Fame, he should be in it. His pocket. Yeah, was amazing, and he, you, you have to have a great drummer to yeah. have great records. Yeah, and there was no studio guys; it was just Jimmy, on Camp by a Thrill, and he played the hell out of that stuff. He did. I mean, it's one of my favorite albums of all time. I, I have to say it. I mean, I love all the early records, but and that record is so great, start to finish. I mean, it's. Oh, I'm glad you liked it. Oh, every song, Fire in the Hole, you name it. I love Turn That Heartbeat Over Again. Everything, I love that album so much. It's a, it's one of my favorites since I was young, you know, and it's just and it still to me holds up. It's a beautiful record. And that was a weird steel guitar solo on that because I didn't want to play guitar. They said wanted me to, want you to play steel. I'm thinking okay, well, meanwhile I'm in the house band at the Palomino Club, you know, I'm playing country music. I'm out with Linda Ronstadt. I'm yeah. doing you know all this country stuff. I said I don't know I got to figure something out here. Yeah, I got it. So I don't know. I thought I'd say okay, let me see what. What? How do I approach this? Yeah. And Jimmy Hodder said something about make it shake. I thought, okay, I'm not quite sure what that, that is, means. <laughs> but I'm <laughs> yeah. losing really wide vibrato on the bar or something. Yeah. Somehow or other, he inspired me to do that whacked out solo all yeah. in a minor key. A lot, of, not a lot of steel players play in a minor key. So. Yeah. What the hell? It came I, out great. You know, it's. It, you can clear up for me too the story behind reeling in the years and Elliot Randall, your friend who you mm -hmm. brought in, because um, they're being two, both playing guitar and then Denny Diaz. Tell me about this this session and the leads on reeling in the years. Well, Elliot played. I mean, I he he was the guy that played lead on it, and it yeah. makes perfect sense to me. Uh, by that time, we were reaching out to friends and. Um, I don't know. It's just one happened. Yeah, it's, I don't know, it just I don't know how to explain it. It was it was the right guy for the right job. You know? Yeah, and the right song. Like it, it worked out unbelievably well. It's so many great players in the band that were all players. It was it was everybody in that band were were just incredible at the mus music that they did and the mu musicianship. wasn't and, bad for a bunch of kids. Yeah, and you were kids. How how old would you say you guys were at that time, Skunk? Oh, early twenties. Yeah, think. super early twenties. Then comes Countdown to Ecstasy. You do that incredible riff that I love the guitar on 
My Old School, which I love. Talk oh, to me about, thanks. about working on that record. That and, was, um, yeah, I just finished that guitar. I was working at a place called Valley Sound where they repair guitars and amplifiers, and I was doing a lot of custom guitar work. That's how you meet musicians. You know, you're fixing their guitars. So I was out in the parking lot. With a, with a router. I just routed out the body to this Stratocaster that I built from a piece of maple. Routed out, put the electronics in, put it back together, took it down to the studio, plugged it in, and that's what I did that song with. And that was pretty much a first take. Obviously, from the stories, most of which are true, um, Walter Becker and Donald Fagan felt that you had to do something a number of times. I can't say as I agree with that all the time. I think there's some great performances that were lost. But we had a thing in the band called Gotta Have It. Yeah. And I played that solo and they said, well, you know, you should let's do it again. No. I gotta yeah. have it. That works. I'm telling you guys, it works. I mean, I've been a studio rat for I'm, I'm telling you that works. Yeah. And um, I guess well, you're telling me it works. Yeah, so then it I guess certainly it did, worked. You know? It came out great. I mean it's it's just it's an iconic uh, lead in that well, I, you know, I, and I learned, I never took guitar, well, I took one guitar lesson, and the guy spent the whole time transcribing what I was playing, I said, what am I paying this guy for? Yeah. So I stopped taking guitar lessons, but I did, like a lot of players in New York at the time, studied out of um, uh, trumpet and, and uh, saxophone books, because that was the basis for when guitars became amplified, and you could hear them instead of just playing rhythm along with the drummer, they actually were playing melodies. All those guys were playing in jazz bands, and they got their lead chops from trumpet and saxophone. Wow. So I'm looking at the books, and I'm you know saying, oh, that's pretty cool. And so that solo, to me, in the back of my head, I was playing tenor sax. Wow. That's amazing. That's great. Just, and I wasn't aware of that. I've, that's really amazingly important. The phrasing if, yeah. it, it is kind of, yeah, more like a saxophone than a guitar. Yeah, it's it's phenomenal. I just love that. And that, again, Count it Down to Ecstasy, another great album. Next comes Press of Logic, which is an, another album that I absolutely love. Right from the get-go, the biggest single for Steely Dan, which was Ricky Don't Lose That Number, it's such a great song. I just remember summer '74 and listening and hearing that all the time. It has a special lilt to it. There's really. something about that, and the lead that you, you know, that you play into that final bridge, you know, is just there's something about it. I mean, I, I it's, I love it. It's, it's also iconic, but it's like one of my favorite songs, and reminds well, me thanks. of being 12 years old and listening to that record, and then getting Pretzel Logic, which was, you know. A really interesting album cover with the guy pre selling pretzels in New York City on the yeah, street. Right there, right there in <laughs> front of Central Park. Yeah, which was yeah. Uh, an incredible cover. But talk to me about that. By the time you got to the third record, uh, at this point, and you guys really were in pocket as far as uh, everybody that was in the band at that point, because it's well, and then we were, were reaching out to other players too. Yeah, <clears throat> because when you're really successful, Walter and Donald being songwriters, and I think they felt that they wanted to have more control. Of, of, of the interpretation of their stuff. And frankly, I'm already out on the road with the Doobie Brothers and Linda Ronstadt and so, you know other musicians. So it, we, each of us brought what we thought was the best of the best to that record, yeah. for sure. And the Ricky Don't Lose That Number solo was a composition, unlike... Um, my old school where I just, you know, pedal to the metal. Yeah. Balls to the wall. Yeah. And by the way, that's not a reference to male genitals at all. Yeah, no. You know, balls to the wall. Yeah, it means like giving it all. But well, like, yeah. the throttles yeah. on on um, on early Race cars and bombers, cars in general, yeah. And bombers B-17 and B-24 had little balls on them. And when you push the balls all the way to the, to the cockpit dash, that was balls to the wall. Yeah. Anyway. That's great. I, it's little, another you know, thing little, I've learned tonight. More like, stuff, right? More stuff. Yeah. So the, I really thought about that solo. I wanted to compose something that had a rock intro, but then I wanted to move it slightly to the left and and look at uh, chords and melodies that were once removed from the from the key filling. 
So I really thought about that one. I mopped it out in my mind. Yeah, and it's it's uh, just an incredible song. The songs on that record, like any major dude will tell you, and the title track. And Royce Jones. Yeah. Who sang in the band? Yeah. When he sang that song live. Yeah. No matter if we were in a stadium with a bazillion people, it all turned into a small club. That guy. Yeah. Is is such an amazing singer. Yeah. It just blew my mind. We would just sit there, and go, "What's happening?" Yeah. It's just. The coolest guy. Yeah. So everybody, yeah, and the and the background singers were David Cassidy's background singers, the two girls. They were phenomenal. I just saw something on the Midnight Special that was a, a piece that we'd done, I guess, reeling in the years. Yeah. I, it, it's, it's just when you you step back and you look at this, I go, yeah. what? Really? Yeah. Wow. Wow, the contributions that those people make. You don't really realize it while you're doing it, I guess. Yeah, and it was absolutely beautiful. Those performances are incredible. And there was also stuff on Pretzel Logic that was stuff that they had already had in their arsenal, some songs on there, um, I guess that period in time. They were on early demos that Becker and Fender oh, yeah. had together. Like things with like Howard with, Gun with and Howard and 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 um and Jay. And, and right? no Howard and Mark. Howard and Mark. Howie Kalen and, oh. and Mark Volman. Yeah. Who, Flo and Eddie, guys. and originally from the Turtles, yeah. who were all friends, they, when we were just starting out trying to get a record deal, they sang all the background vocals on the demos. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. And they sang with T-Rex, too, so they, like, with Mark Boland, so they did all of those guys. Absolutely. They're, they're <laughs> like, super pros from and Dover. There's guys. a band who deserves so much more love and respect, the Turtles. They made great singles. Oh, great I love records. those records. Yeah. And, uh... From She's My Girl, I mean, you name it. Uh, everything. Everything. Well composed, too. Yeah. I like the way that they made their record. And in the arrangement of You Showed Me, the song that was an early Birds incarnation. Song oh, yeah. First Flight stuff. And uh, I, lo- I love all of that. So, Skunk, at this point, they're not going to tour anymore. And your guy likes to be out and playing. That was your thing. You wanted to, and you, you know. So, talk to me about the transition into the Dewey Brothers, how that happened and how they ended up asking you to become a part of it. Being well, the Doobies, t- you know. the Steely Dan was opening shows for the Doobie Brothers. We were kind of a package. I'm not yeah. quite sure who was booking it, but that was the way it was. A couple of guys in the Doobie Brothers said, hey, would you like to sit in yeah. with us for a couple of songs? I said, sure, you know. I'm a session rat. I mean, I'll, I'll write stuff out and I'm going to go play it. And then it became two songs, then it became four songs, then it became eight songs, then half a show, and... Kind of like, okay, well, um, maybe you should go out and start touring with us. And I said, wow, that's fantastic. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I love the music. It's a lot of fun to play. Very guitar-oriented. Yeah. In the in the vein of probably the greatest American rock and roll band ever, Moby Grape. Yeah, who I oh, um Three guitar love. players. Killer. Yeah. Just killer. Well, there's another one of those records that, if Columbia hadn't messed up the promotion of it so much. And, and released too many si- All singles, the album. 805 should have been a smash. One of the most beautiful That's songs That's one of the most beautiful time. songs ever. It's one of my favorite songs ever. I still sit back and just play it because it <laughs> yeah. sounds so beautiful. So gorgeous. It's a song that I discovered on this compilation album when I was a child in the 60s. And I heard this song, 805 by Moby Grape, and I went, I fell in love with it. To yeah, this day, it's just beautiful. I just, I, when, for a little while I lived in San Francisco and I had the 805 area code, but anytime I see 805 on a clock, I think of that song because it's just one of the greats. <laughs> and I'm surprised. You know what? I think it's time to cover that song because I'm going to do another record. Let me think yeah. about that one. Let's you should thank think about you covering for that. that I agree. It's one of the most beautiful songs ever. And it would be beautiful yeah. with Pedal Steel. It would. You know, so, yeah. okay. Making a note here. Yeah, you got to do that. Right. Yeah. And Hey Grandma. Geez. Yeah. Hey Grandma. Talk about rocking. Rocking. Omaha. All those songs on that. Omaha. Yeah. I mean, yeah. That's so. Yeah. yeah I, I I fought uh, Columbia for screwing that pu- that pooch up. Yeah. But that band, three guitar players. That's what sort of was the. I, I can't say it was a copy, but the architectural setup of three guitar players, the Moby Grape vibe. So then I got into playing with those guys a lot. So it's you, Tom, and Patrick, right? and doing your Myself thing. and Tommy and Patrick. Yeah. Uh, and our styles are so different, just like um, uh, the guys in Moby yeah. Grape. Uh, Skip Spence was Skip very Spence. different. Than, I mean, everybody, uh, Jerry had, everybody had their own thing. So I'm out on the road doing a 
festival at Nebworth in, in England at the Nebworth Rock Festival, sitting in a hotel room, and I get a call from the guys in Steely Dan saying, you know, we just don't want to tour anymore. So I thought, well, all right, uh, whatever. So I hung up the phone. I said, well, that's it for me and Steely Dan because I, you know, I like playing live. I said, well, you're in the doobies now. Okay. Great. Thanks. And next Terrific. Year. Yeah, it's and cool. that was a one. That's that was a delightful thing. Even playing drums with him for sometimes for about a quarter of the show because one of the drummers wanted to play percussion, and I started out as a drummer as a kid in Mexico. I mean, I'm playing in surf bands, you know, I'm ten, nine, ten years old playing, yeah, playing drums, and so I, and the Doobies took a drum teacher with them on the road, a guy from Chicago music. Uh, I don't. I wish I could remember his name, but the quintessential drum machine, drum, drum teacher. Yeah. You know, here's the, uh, here's your drum books, and here's here's your drum pad, and we're sitting on the doobie liner, and um, okay, practicing for an hour, but here's the exercises. You know, it was it was just wow. It was just <laughs> fabulous. So I and I love playing drums, and then the then the band started to. Uh, Evolve, certainly with um, uh, Stampede, and then uh, Tommy uh, had some serious health problems. We actually were about to go on stage in, at uh, Louisiana State University in the big field house there, and Tommy just couldn't get out of the dressing room. He was having a, I guess it was an ulcer, ulcer, ulceritis. Yeah. And so I walked out on stage. I said. Here's the deal. We'll, you can all have your money back, or if you give us 10 days, we'll come back and do a show. Nobody turned in their money, and as soon as the show was over, or as soon as I got backstage, um, I called Mike McDonald. I said, I'm sending you a one-way ticket to, to Louisiana. I, you need to play with the doobies. He went, okay. <laughs> yeah. And came out. We rehearsed for 10 hours a day for 10 days and came out and they got five encores and that was the next iteration. Yeah. So, you know, I guess every once in a while you got to make a command decision. Yeah. Worked out. It really but, did. I mean, when you hear it keeps you running and all these great songs that oh, came. Yeah. I mean, you know, that's oh, just yeah. amazing stuff. It's really And great. then as the band started to evolve with Michael, um, I'm still have my Steely Dan DNA and Michael did some, work with Steely Dan as well. Singing backups. So I had talked to the producer, Ted Templeman, and I said, I got an idea. You tell me if I'm, well, I know I'm crazy, but you tell me. I think the Doobie Brothers should start doing sessions for other artists as a rhythm section. He said, that's a great idea. So Hoyt Axton, Leo Sayer, Carly Simon. And my DNA is about I don't care what band you're in, kid. That red light goes on. You either play it right or you're fired. You be here at 9 o'clock for a 9 o'clock downbeat, and that's it. Yeah. Or else there's 2,000 people at the Guitar Institute of Technology waiting for that chair. Yeah. Okay, great. So to me, that discipline, I mean, I love the rock star stuff. Don't get me wrong. I, I appreciate all that. But for me, being Top Gun was really the name of the game being a first call studio guy. Yeah. So the band went out and killed it as a rhythm section. The, the, the depth of talent in that band that hadn't been, you know, uh, hadn't been realized because the music was good. It was great. But the, the depth of each of those players was, I don't, I don't know how to describe it, profound. Yes. So... Here we are doing Leo Sayer. Here we are doing Carly Simon. And then when we went to do what I think is the quintess, quintessential Doobie Brothers album, Living on the Fault Line, yeah. which if you listen to it, they go, what the hell is going on here? Yeah. I mean, what is this? You know, Dizzy Gillespie? What is this? Is You know, what are these arrang- what's going on? Uh, I remember Keith Knudsen. We were listening back to one of the tracks, and he said to me, Geez, you know, I think I dropped a snare drum beat in bar 51. I said, bingo. Now you get it. Yeah. Welcome to my world. Yeah. And then I think that whole attitude and that that self-discovery and digging deep into the musical capabilities of all the players in that band 
made the minute by minute album possible. Yeah. And then, of course, everything. It was just. There was, hey. It, you guys were. It, I mean, it's just. You never know. Those two stages of of the band. Uh, it's, two, it, it's amazing how many great songs and hits and albums came out. And of it that. is a <laughs> tribute to the musical capability, uh, open mindedness, and vision of all the players in that band. Yeah, it's amazing. And it's like. You look, I look back and I think about that with you. And Tommy Johnson and, and Patrick Simmons, and it's just and everybody else, the whole back then. And, you, and there was some real fun three-masted schooner guitar stuff. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, oh God, the songs ev- evade me now, but uh, um, Stocky SoCal Rag yeah. and stuff like that were just were burning. Yeah. A little steel here, a little guitar here, a little, yeah. you know, hey. It's you know, fun. You guys, it's, you could tell you guys were having so much fun doing it, which was oh, so yeah. great. And then you've done so many other... I mean, sessions with so many people, whether it's Joni Mitchell or even Dolly Parton, you played on a 9 to 5 record. That's right. Which That's is... Right. What so, a sweetheart. Yeah, which I think is so great. I mean, it's so cool. I just love the fact that you've hot collaborated... Hot Stuff, Donna Summer. Donna Summer, which you did with Hot Stuff, which is a great song and a smash, right? I mean, it was... Well, we turned it from just a disco record into a rock and roll or a rock record. Because it's true. That song on that record is the one that has that rock edge to it when you know well that's what georgia wanted yeah i mean he calls me he calls my assistant she says no nah, he's not available because he looked at my book you know I'm, I'm i'm booked so i said somebody calls says georgia maroder i, I said well what did, he said i said she said i i told him you were booked no so i called georgia and said what do you want me to do he said i want you to play the rock guitar i said what kind of music is it he said it's a disco and I've been doing so many disco sections. Jay Graydon, who's yeah. another incredible studio guy, we used to go down to, to to Marino's or Martoni's on a Monday and decide which riff we're going to play for the whole week. Yeah. I mean, not to be the, you know, we were being a little disingenuous, but hey, come on. But so that's I, what it was. I mean, you know, it, well, yeah. You know, it is what it is, and that's yeah. okay. I'm a, I'm a session rat. You tell me what you want, and I deliver. So I said, call Jay. <laughs> He called Jay and he said, "Call Skunk." So, he calls me back and I said, "Okay, on one condition, that um, I can play what I want." And he said, "Please." So I showed up. Uh, I was on my way to the session, or I, was, I, I booked the session. Then I realized all my guitars were either in transit, and my cartage company was remod. I mean, I, I couldn't. I didn't have anything because I just moved. So I needed a guitar. So I went down to Guitar Center, and uh, so I'm looking, I'm looking around, and um, the owner of Guitar Center is just a wonderful, wonderful cat. You know, he passed away again, but a you know, wonderful guy. I used to go down there when I needed parts for guitars. I'd go into the back room, I'd grab a guitar, I'd smash it against the wall, and I'd come out and say, hey, man, this guitar's all screwed up. Can you sell it to me for parts? He knew what I was he, Yeah. Nobody cared. That's you know, amazing. It was, it, was, it was a lot of fun. So he, there was a box in the middle of the, st- of the store that said, buy me 30 bucks. There were like five or six guitars in this big cardboard box. And so I pulled out this Burns Baby Bison that had five regular tuning machines, one that somebody had screwed on, nailed in, and said, hey, this is okay, I'll give you 30 bucks for it. So I put some new strings on it, grabbed a six-pack of Bud, went down to Rusk Studios, walked into the studio. There was a deluxe reverb there, turned everything up to 10, plugged it in, and said, let's go. And... We did Hot Stuff. And Hot Stuff, which was the number one record. And <laughs> unbelievable. It's incredible with Donna Summer. I mean, you've, that's what I love so much, Skunk. You've played with so many great people and brought so much incredible sound, riffage, and just, you know, melody. But, you know, just and the sound. The, 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 you, there's so much variety in the sound that you brought to the different records, too. Well, I do, I do wind my pickups on my mom's sewing machine. Yeah. I mean, I've been building guitars and for for many years. Tell I worked with Dan that. Armstrong, so I learned my craft from him and a number of other folks. So, but you know, the sound of a guitar, I, I love all the technical stuff. Well, you know, yeah. if you have the the way that the that the the, the, the magnetic shadows yeah. dance over the the Al Nico five magnets wound yeah. with number, okay, that's all great. Most guitar players who are any good at all can get anything from anything yeah. because it's the way they attack the instrument. It's the way that they 
their fingers and the pick. and It's a combination of pretty much a unique way of approaching the instrument that really gets the sound. Because the sound is very complex. It's not just striking a string. I mean, I look at my fingers. Uh, it looks like about a quarter of an inch of the, the fingernail on this finger crosses the string before it even hits the pick. Wow. So yeah. there's all this harmonic stuff going yeah. on pre-strike, yeah. I guess it is. And then where you pr- strike it changes the harmonic content, all of that. So I appreciate that because I guess it means that whatever I'm doing seems to make you happy. It and does. that's my job. It certainly does. You know, I mean, you've, you've worked on so many records that I absolutely love. And, you know, that's, for me... That's the most important thing because music's, you know. And then the greatest instrument who, which is ever invented is the pedal steel guitar. Yeah. Just, oh, the and beauty, the, the way it cries and the way it oh, plays, man. right? That's, <laughs> that's why I did, on this Speed of Heat record, there's a song on there called The Rose, which is the, the one that, uh, it was originally a vocal. Um, so I, I'm on the advisory board of Guitar Player Magazine, naturally. I'm writing a, yeah. the eclectic electric column every month about yeah. wacky stuff and they say we're going to have a 25th anniversary would you play something while we show photographs of those of our colleagues who've passed on I said sure and i like what not think of then i heard the rose i was driving down the street on the radio and i thought just the melody this song is beautiful so i'm going to take a shot at this so anyway went out pedal steel sat down because i love the voice of the instrument so much i said i'm going to do an acapella version of the rose yeah. so i'm playing and i get almost to the end of the first verse and adrian Ballou comes out and plugs in and wow. i th- I love adrian he's one of yeah. my favorite people on the planet and just a wonderful guitar player yeah great guitar player really inventive too right oh, absolutely yeah, fearless I mean, yeah i like those guys yeah exactly so by the time we get to the end of the second verse there's a keyboard player drummer and a bass player yeah so later on i thought if i ever do a solo record I would like to do this, this arrangement. <clears throat> and I'd like to have an a cappella performance of Pedal Steel so people can listen to yeah. the voice of this thing. Yeah. So, and then I thought, okay, I never really was able to tell my dad how much I really loved him. So I thought maybe this is the way to do it. So the a cappella piece, speaking to my dad, and then the end of the record, the piece of the arrangement there. I just thought that that's the most beautiful voice I've ever heard in my life. This, yeah. If I could sit back and let this thing do what it does, yeah. I, yeah. But I gotta, you know, I gotta yeah, get involved you gotta, here. You gotta make it happen. But yeah. But there's it, a beauty and sadness in everything uh, when it comes to the pedal steel that I love. There's just so much beauty. It's celebratory, but it, you know what I mean. You can there take is it something in so about it. There's no doubt. And uh, when I did the Heidi and Frank show, yeah, and they played the Rose, Heidi actually began to tear up yeah she got it yeah she, she understood what that instrument can say and speak absolutely and it's amazing that you do that and we have to talk about the new record too because speed of heat make doing this record uh you did you did a, an arrangement of of do it again and of course my old school which it, which are both on there and then you did a track with clint black let's talk about uh your friendship yeah, well, she, it's gonna come out in a couple of weeks yeah so and again these guys it was gonna be an instrumental record yeah, and then I ran into Mike McDonald. Uh, we were doing a charity event together up in Santa Barbara, and he said, "What are you doing?" I said, "I'm doing a solo record." I'm doing. It. He said, "Well, you want me to play on it?" I thought, "Boink." Yeah. Uh, in one femtosecond, I made that decision. That yeah. He's now doing vocals. As a great keyboardist and a, and a great vocalist. And the same with Clint. Ran into him, Johnny Lang did at the at the the Sundance Film Festival. We played yeah. together. Same thing. It's just okay, you guys. Love to have you. You're right with my killer uh, music partner and co-producer, um, C.J. Vanson, and yeah. you do something, we do something you've never done before. You listen to that Clint Black record, and you'd have a hard time unless you under really knew Clint's voice and knew who that was. Yeah. His talent, the depth of his capability and his, of his musicianship is unbelievable. Johnny Lang, the same thing. That like, chorus on I Can Do Without, yeah, that's not blues. Yeah, That's heavy metal. It is, yeah. You know, and I the guy you. is doing the crap out of it. And Yeah, Johnny's an incredible, I mean, obviously yeah. he's a prodigy like so many others, but he, but he was amazing. And the fact that you 
wanted him to stretch the limits of what he's known for. Push and it. Same with cool. Michael. Yeah. Push. Put, that yeah. record is, you've never done anything like that. Yeah, which is great. I mean, I think this is, it, it, it's so cool that you've done this. And Well, I enjoy digging deep. I think it's more, it's fun to see what's on the other side. Yeah. Of all this stuff. Yeah, and it, and it's working. Tell me about the live show that's going to be happening at the uh, Troubadour on the 22nd. Cause... <laughs> we played the Troubadour before and yeah. had a wonderful time. Yeah. And we're going to do it again. <laughs> do it again, bubble and shh, right? Yeah. Um, we're going to play on the 22nd of, uh, of August, and we have a, a, another keyboard player playing with us. Uh, and it's kind of family. Yeah. It's David Crosby's son. Yeah. And David was a friend. Yeah. Still is. I mean, just because they pass away doesn't take you out of their... Yep. Or take them out of your orbit. Yes. And he came on board, does an incredible job. Um, I so, absolutely miss CJ because he's my friend yeah. for so many years. Uh, but he's out doing some other projects, which is absolutely good for him. Yeah. And so we're going to, again, have a wonderful night, have a fun night. And who knows who'll show up at, like yeah. last time. Um, oh, you got so many friends, right? Kip it, Lennon came. Yeah. From, uh, from um, um, those guys are like, the, the studio singers, yeah, and uh, walked up and did uh, um, uh, uh, your favorite song, um, the the ballad. Oh, uh, which, Ricky Dolan's that number, which I love and, so much. Yeah. Went, Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Everybody else. Yeah. You know, come on up. Let's let's yeah. have some fun. But I love this band. This band is fearsome. I already told you about Mark Damien, the drummer. Yeah. The bass player, Hank Horton, is the bass player for the Detroit Symphony. Yeah. I mean, these guys are frightening. Yeah. In so the... <laughs> great. That's a, that's going to be great. I mean, I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm excited for this new record coming out, too. And well, just, thank it's, you. Uh, Scott, we, you know, I want to say we are going to have to do this again because there's so many more stories, I'm sure, that we could do, talk about. Well, you got your other show. I said I'm happy to, you know, I got a million stories. Yeah. And so I much I can them. never tell. Yeah. So much I can. And the ones that you can share with us would be really There's some great. good ones. Yeah. Because if you're a studio rat, I mean, you wouldn't believe some of the wacky stuff that goes on. Oh, I can imagine you know? the stuff that you've seen, which is incredible, <laughs> especially throughout the decades. Yeah, there's some there's some fun there's yeah. some fun stuff. Yeah, and we're gonna we'll definitely have to touch on more of those again. But I want to let everybody know once again, Speed of Heat is the new album. Skunk, I just want to tell you how much I loved having you on the show. What a pleasure! Well, thanks for your hospitality. It means and, a lot. Yeah, and I love talking music. You know, just hearing your stories are so great, and, and you know, it brings more for me. It brings you know more enlightenment to what those songs and sessions were like, and you know what it was like to record them. And I love that we. Both bonded over 805 and Moby Great. I that in, that note is duly noted, my friend. Yeah, Absolutely. I think you should cover it. I think it should be great. You know, yeah, when I'm when I'm just sitting around, I yeah. want I pull a guitar out. I say 50 percent of the time, that's the first thing that comes to mind. Yeah, it's just it's a beautiful two and a half minutes, man. It's it maybe if it's two and a half, might of, be two of honey. Yeah, it is beautiful. Absolutely, Skunk. Thanks for coming in. Thank you for inviting me. So friend. great to have thanks, you. Man. Skunk Baxter, everybody. This is KLOS New and Approved. I'm Matt Pinfield, and I'll be back with you very soon. Thanks so much for watching and listening.